Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to another episode of Sri's daily global COVID-19 show. My name is Sri Srinivasan, and it's my honor to convene this daily conversation around various aspects of the pandemic. These are part of our Stony Brook journalism episodes. My students at the Stony Brook School of Journalism are producing several episodes as part of our Digital Innovations in Journalism course. Tonight's episode is produced by Sean Gribben, Nicholas Grasso, and Elisha Asif, and guest hosted by Sean and Nick. You'll meet both of them in just a minute. Today, you can see we have an unusual card because we have an unusual show all about entertainment with three essential entertainers. Leslie Mendelssohn is here, an indie singer and songwriter. Her new lyric video all come together out today. Her single, Head and Heart, released earlier this month. She's streaming live from the City Winery this Thursday, so please join her for that. Bruce Pandolfo is with us, poet and musician, performing under the moniker All One, and with the band The Room, his new single from the Emotionauts LP is available next week on Friday. And Rich Scheidner is with us, author and comedian, featured in the documentary I Am Comic, his book, Kicking Through the Ashes, My Life as a Stand-Up in the 80s Comedy Boom, is available now. Three unusual entertainers who are going to help us understand what is happening in the entertainment world during the pandemic. And you will meet all of them in just a minute. Hi, everyone. I'm Sri. Thank you so much for being here. I'm the Marshall Loeb Visiting Professor of Digital Innovation at the Stony Brook School of Journalism. Please share this video. We're live on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. I'm also the co-founder of DigiMentors, a social, digital, and virtual events consulting company. Our motto, let us help you with your virtual event. We have done events for 50 people and 100,000 people. I'm sure your event is somewhere between those two numbers. We are delighted to have you with us so we can talk about all kinds of aspects of COVID-19, please share this. We're live on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, and on LinkedIn. And if you haven't seen the show before, in our first 230 episodes, we've had more than a million viewers, 156 million social impressions, 419 guests, including 249 women from 71 cities and 20 countries, including the chief scientist of the World Health Organization. We're live on all our channels, but also on youtube.com slash Srinet. Please hit subscribe. We're so grateful to our producers, Rose Horowitz at Rose Horowitz 31 and Vandana Menon, Vandana underscore Menon. Please follow them. And now let's bring on two of our guest hosts who helped put this together, students at Stony Brook School of Journalism, and let them tell us more about how this show came to be, this episode came to be. Say hello, please, to Sean and Nick. So let me say, bring them on. Hi, folks. How are you doing? Thank you very much for being here. Great to have you. Uh, thank you. So let me ask you both, uh, tell me how you put together this episode for tonight. Nick, would you like to go first or is it me? Sure thing. So we wanted to do something regarding entertainment. Uh, I'm a big music guy. Sean is a big comedy guy. And we knew that working together, uh, we could put something together because the two worlds, they're both forms of live entertainment that are drastically different right now due to COVID-19. And we knew that you started your show uh, regarding the changes that come about with COVID-19. So we knew that we could have something special if we brought on the right people. So that's yeah, great. And what's, oh, and what I think what's really important during these times is that music, comedy, and all other, you know, streamed televised art forms really have been getting people through this pandemic and crisis. So I just hope, uh, not hope, I know this is going to be a great show that brings some people some laughs, some good information, and I think we're going to have a great time while putting it on. Terrific. So I'm going to bring our guests onto the stage so they can say hello to uh, all of us. And I'm just so grateful that they are with us here tonight. So. Uh, please welcome onto the stage Leslie Mendelson. Hi, Leslie. Hi. Rich Scheidner. Hi, Rich. Hi. And Bruce. Hi, Bruce. Hello. Bruce Pandolfo. Thank you very much for being here. 
We are going to get started and I'm going to leave you folks in the hands of my terrific students. Uh, they're gonna ask much tougher questions than I ever would. So I'm gonna step aside. I'll come back in a few minutes over to Nick and Sean. All right, well, I guess we're gonna do the, uh, the intro then. So how are you? Where are you? What is going on in your lives right now? Uh, we'll start with Bruce, <laughs> since you're on the left. Sure. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, I am home in Smithtown, uh, not far from the Stony Brook campus. And uh, I'm well. I'm well. I'm a Stony Brook student, so I've been dealing with all that virtual stuff. Um, and uh, I've been creating pretty regularly. And just kind of the last month or two got back to my day job regularity. Uh, so getting into a new groove as everyone else is and uh, find, finding ways to survive in it and adapt. <laughs> That's great. And Leslie, where are you joining us from? I'm in my apartment in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, but I, I'm from Long Island and I lived really close to Stony Brook University growing up. Um, but I'm, I'm here and um, what can I say? This is a... Um, you know, living the dream every day. And Rich, what about you? I'm in Asheville, North Carolina, and uh, it's very nice down here, living on the side of a mountain. Bears coming by regularly and uh, checking out our trash. And uh, I'm doing a lot of writing. And, and, and as everyone has noted, adapting, adapting in the pandemic in terms of, of entertainment. All right. I was going to say, you look, Rich, you look a lot different than, than your stand-up videos. You got the beard, longer hair. Yeah. 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 I let, I let it go. I'm, I'm going to, I'm just going to let it go until the pandemic's over. Come out of here looking just Rip Van Winklish. <laughs> All right. So with that, we're going to hop into our first question. So when was the last time each of you were on stage and what was it like? We'll start with Bruce. Um, actually I was, I had the pleasure of being on a stage in Stony Brook, East Setauket area outdoors, um, with minimal people and people with their masks on, as long as they were not seated, um, just about a month ago, maybe five weeks ago. Um, and, uh, yeah, that was really wonderful to be back among community and, and experience the sort of electricity that only live performance and all the improvisational odds and ends that occur during them, uh, you know, get experienced. So that was really, really special. And it definitely had me like aching to just be back even more than before I had returned. So yeah, it was great. Nice. And Leslie, what about you? Last time you were on stage? Well, I, so let's see, I did a couple of things this summer. Uh, they were, you know, outdoors and that was okay. You know, they, they were, I, I couldn't believe like, it felt great the last time we did it. It was this, it was a backyard party and people were socially distanced and, the, you know, got to play a real show in front of people because before that, I think it was, you know, just early, early, late February was my last show. So, you know, we've all been relegated to doing uh, live streams from our rooms. <laughs> nice. It's good to know that you guys got to feel some of that fresh air when you perform. Um, Rich, what about yourself? Uh, two weeks ago in Henderson, North Carolina, brewery, a patio outside, uh, about 40 people distance in place that they normally hold around 200. But it, it was live. It was laughter. I heard laughter. I can't do a Zoom show. Zoom shows don't work for comics because you can't hear the laughter. No laughter, no show. And uh, so this was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Got a chance to just play with the audience and do a lot of new material about the pandemic. And it was fun. A lot of fun. Now, Rich, um, I heard a lot of news over the summer that comics were doing shows kind of drive-in style where there were cars and people were honking instead of laughing. Were you a part of any of those shows or no? No, it, it's so ironic that that became acceptable. That is in Steve Martin's book, uh, his autobiography, Born Standing Up, as a nightmare hell gig that he did a drive-in where people just honked instead of laughed. It's, 
it's axiomatic. I mean, comics have to have the laughter. So comics were desperate. They did Zoom shows and drive-in shows, but um, honking a horn just doesn't cut it. And it doesn't, comics get their energy, their timing. The whole show's predicated on the laughter. It's like a band. You go, okay, we're going to have a five-piece band and four people don't show up. And then one person's out there just playing the bass drum all night long. It doesn't work. Nice. So Leslie, could you tell us a little bit about if playing music live works over Zoom or through any other live streaming? That's better than stand up. <laughs> I, feel, I feel sorry. I have a few comedian friends and I'm, I've been going to, there's this place called The Stand. In oh, I know that. City. Yeah. And um, it's, it's hilarious because it's so awkward and they're really good at making it super awkward, you know, just digging into that. And um, yeah. there's like trucks going by and, <laughs> and, you know, and now they're like doing these weird things that, you know, just semi-legal places, but they're like plexiglass. You can't have atmosphere like that for a comedian. So I feel like we're, we're, we're you know, it's a little better for us because I can play um, on, on my own and play. I mean, it's, 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 it sucks, but it's, it's, you know, it's something to do and, you know, getting the little messages when you're doing your, um, your live stream is really nice, except I'm blind. I'm like looking like that. And then I'm trying to, <laughs> that. That's not fun. but, um, but it's, it's, you know, in the beginning of the pandemic when there was nothing going on and all of a sudden certain venues were, were hosting your live stream from your room, at least it felt like there was some sense of community because it was like in the beginning, the, you know, God, it, was, shit, it was weird. So, you know, it was better. It got, and now that we're doing these, shows a little bit more and more so we'll see i don't know what's going to happen this winter but you know <laughs> yes you do <laughs> it's going to get cold yes, I do. it's not going to be fun <laughs> everybody's got to go inside <laughs> get your heat lamp <laughs> so i want to talk to you guys a little about uh creating during this time um before the pandemic did you have a sort of work routine where you knew you had to write uh, a certain number of days during the week, or if you had a, a specific schedule for creating uh, new songs or new scripts. Um, and did that change during the pandemic? Um, so Rich, if we could start with you, uh, what has it been like creating under lockdown? Well, it's been a blessing for my writing. I write all the time. I've, I've written a new script. I write all the time. I don't have to worry about travel or, you know, performance is a whole different mindset. It's a whole different energy. So the writing has been great. And I've, I've found that other people, I mean, you know, I know so many comics complaining about their careers being stalled, but then this young woman, Sarah Cooper did, Cooper did TikTok impressions, you know, just not impressions, but she lip synced pr Trump's uh, speeches and she became a hit and she became a huge hit. So people have found creative ways to exploit the pandemic and, uh, and move their careers along. So I'm a guy who's like, you can't say retired because as a comic, I'm, you retired when people stop giving you jobs, when they stop giving me jobs then I'm retired. Otherwise I've never retired, but you know, I'm, I'm in a different place in my career than a lot of young comics. So I feel bad for They got stalled, uh, you know, because the live shows stalled out and, and there's less TV going on and everything. Mm -hmm. So talking about how younger people are uh, feeling during this time, Bruce, let's switch over to you. What has it been like creating? Uh, I have to agree, uh, in some ways it's, you know, it, it is, there is a silver lining. Um, uh, you know, a, a lot of people I find, uh, were mostly just looking for opportunities to not have to perform a lot of their obligations, um, that were more quotidian and more, uh, you know, their, their work and the, the banalities of their day and, and the quarantine kind of put a lot of that to the side. Um, I was furloughed from a job and, and I had a lot of time at home and, uh, yeah, I found it, uh, really great. I mean, <laughs> it was, it was great to, uh, to be able to mostly just focus on things. And I, I got a, um, a studio situation up and running in my house and, and, uh, started recording a lot of demos and, and learned a lot with, um, home recording, and uh, different writing routines and different projects. Um, uh, I inherited a, a typewriter from a uh, funny, we're in this conversation about, um, you know, technology, but 
uh, a family member gave me a typewriter and, and I just recently started doing like typewritten poems and taking commissions and whatnot. Um, and I was also doing um, audiobooks by request uh, in the early uh, weeks of the pandemic. So I was finding ways to keep myself busy and entertained. I mean, creative people are going to come up with creative solutions and we have to make things to we're like sharks. We need to keep moving to live. So, uh, you know, we all find our ways to, to make it happen, you know. Nice. And Leslie, you recently put out so much during this time, uh, but among other things, you put out an acoustic EP and a single, um, which is a cover. So what has it been like? Have you come up with any new material? No. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are like, killing it. Um, no, no, it's just like, I don't know, just <laughs> trying my best to like, <laughs> do something i'm so uninspired but um i'm trying so you know like so the record we had um planned to put the record out in april and we're like we're gonna put it out anyway and i'm glad we did because you know people had some time to listen to it so i thought that was you know it that wasn't the worst i mean it sucks because we weren't able to promote it but put it out and then doing all these live streams okay i made kind of a more of a rock and roll record this time so I had to rethink the way I was going to um, perform the song. So we strip, I was stripping things down and, and that inspired the little EP I did over the summer called In the Meantime. And um, I took some of the songs from the record and then a few covers and, um, and yeah, and that's it. I've done nothing since. <laughs> no, that's it. But. And just so everyone knows out there watching, uh, the name of that record is If You Can't Say Anything Nice. That's the record from April. Yeah, that's the main record. Yes, and Sean, I believe you have more. <laughs> yes, so going off of writing, I want to talk a bit about each of your material, and this question does have a bit of exposition buildup. So, Rich, your stand-up from both then and now is just hysterical. I was watching old clips of you on The Tonight Show, and I really like that bit, especially about 4D horror movies and all those bits. There was one about Indiana Jones that was funny. Um, and I also got a kick out of you fencing Steve Martin in that film, uh, Roxanne, with a golf club. Um, then, Leslie, I listened to your music over the weekend, and I really liked um, All Come Together. And I really, uh, your song Head and Heart was really good. I r really liked it. And then, Bruce, I got to ch listen to a lot of your music that Elijah described as experimental. So what I wanted to talk about is what inspires you when writing these songs or jokes and how do you approach them? Uh, we'll start with Leslie. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Um, what was the question? No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, let me say, um, Head and Heart, that's um, John Martin. That's, that's a cover. I threw a couple of covers on my little EP this summer. Um, that's, uh, yeah. I, what, what inspires songs? Um, a lot of this stuff came from, well, it was before the pandemic, but it's kind of interesting because, um, see, this is my pandemic hair. I haven't cut my hair in a while. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, um, it kind of stemmed from, I have like, I'm, I have got a lot of anxiety and I'm sorry, I'm getting so distracted from this. <laughs> is anybody else saying this? Okay. Anyway, um, <laughs> A lot of the inspiration came from just being alive right now. We're dealing with a 24 hour news cycle. We're dealing with um, opioid crisis. We're dealing with all sorts of things that like, for me, I just burst from anxiety. So uh, that this this album was kind of an outlet for these feelings. And I, maybe I've never really sung about that stuff before. And then the fact that it got released during the pandemic was kind of um, interesting because it just felt like all that, those feelings were heightened from just being in the time we were in. So it all made sense. And um, yeah, does that answer right. your question? <laughs> uh, yes, yes it did. So moving on, uh, Bruce. Um, I mean, there's always potentially boring answers to, to why things are uh, inspired or why they came to be or what quickened them inside you. Uh, but, uh, you know, what I found, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the experience during the pandemic, just to keep it relevant. Um, the things I made, um, I, I ended up collaborating with a handful of people that sort of just 
came out of the woodwork and were friends of mine and, and they were kind of in the in the hopper, so to speak, uh, people that I had been meaning to that I had been friends with or whatnot and develop closer relationships with artistically and socially and, um, you know, wrote a few songs with people that just reached out. And, you know, in all of this, I think everyone was yearning for connection and, and yearning for something to be preoccupied by, uh, whether it w offered some uh, you know, respite from the the woes and the insanity of, of the hellscape we've been living in, uh, or, uh, you know, just some some way to channel some of that. Um, and so, yeah, that was that was a lot of of that. Um, but, you know, the, the music, the poetry, the writing kind of comes from everywhere, whether it's internal or external stories uh, and trying to work our way through them and the issues that come are about those narratives. Mm hmm. And Rich, yourself? Well, you know, the comic uh, formula really hasn't changed uh, over the last couple of million years. It's I have some sort of uh, complaint, which I have to turn the big wheel and make it something funny. And the complaint being anything from irritation to something outrage. And um, you just got to make that funny. It's it's bile. It's bile in me that I got to treat to to make it something that I can live with. So uh, whatever it is, like right now I'm writing these little stories. Um, uh, uh, I call them Somewhere in trump Erica, and they're just little short stories <laughs> about people in Trump's America, and uh, I get a lot of kick out of doing it. And so the inspiration is everywhere. I mean, I, I had a fun thing, wrote this little story about a, a Trump Tilla, and uh, it ends up with a fiery explosion and a bunch of people dead, and I laughed, you know? That made me, made me laugh, made other people laugh. So that's, that's what it is. It's inspired by things that are happening around you. Like the pandemic, uh, you know, I, I, I read books on the, when the thing started, I read some books on the on past, you know, the, the pandemics, the, the great plagues in the past and the great plague of, of the 14th century took out about a third of the people of Europe. But that labor shortage caused a huge shift. It caused the end of the, of the serfdom and the end of the caste system and the beginning of the rise of the middle class and so I thought, you know, if this thing turns out really bad and a lot of people die, it's going to be bad for the people who die. But for the people who live, they're going to get some kick ass jobs. So I'm just trying to find some positive in there, something funny to do, you know, at the end of it. That's all. It's all the same as it ever was in terms of jokes. You know, you just have to you're something irritates you. I don't care if it's Jerry Seinfeld, Bill Burr, Sarah Silverman, whoever it is, something irritates them. And then they have to move that into something funny because they can't live with the irritation. That's it. Yeah, Bill Burr is definitely, I have a few posters of his. He's definitely a number one comic for me. And his recent SNL uh, show was yeah, just a miracle to me. I, um, I wrote a, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Wait, you I wrote, wrote a, what? I wrote, a, I, wrote a, I wrote a review of it. I wrote a long review of it. I analyzed every joke. It was, it was, a, it was, a, you know, he's a line dancer. He goes right up to the line and he dances on it. And a lot of comics mm -hmm. can't stand on that dance. It's a fine line. And he's a, he's a king of the rants, and and a lot of people didn't even pick up. They heard him go after white women, and they turned off before he even they even considered what he was actually saying. And it was hilarious. It was just a great, great, uh, you know, prov provocative bit of stand up, r reminiscent of the greats. Really is. Mm -hmm. All right. So jumping off of that, I want to jump back to something that Bruce uh, had mentioned, talking about what inspires him. So. Since you are a student and you are trying to start your career and in the beginnings of it, during all of this and your education, how do you balance your time between this? Well, between the two, really. And I was wondering if Rich and Leslie, do you have any advice on how to better balance your career with other life responsibilities? <laughs> okay. I'll just, no. I'll just take the advice, please, because the answer in no. short is is poorly. The answer is poorly. Uh, I, I chase I chase my manias, and uh, and I, I try to grapple something that helps me make sense of the day or or whatever chaos happens in my head as I digest the world around me uh, with wide eyes. And uh, yeah, I mean, how do I make it work uh, by scrambling always, sleeping woefully little uh <laughs> and uh you know just trying to do things last minute often so uh, it's definitely not a master class in time management uh it, it's more of a a, uh, a a master class in in just trying to 
uh, keep myself stimulated and, and chase different ambitions that keep piling up on my shoulders. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll see if I come out of it, uh, as Atlas <laughs> or not, but, um, yeah, I mean, honestly, it's, it's, it's a, still a work in progress for sure. Um, but we're, we're trying and, uh, I'm, I'm going to the deadlines, uh, feeling very dead as I approach them. <laughs> Nice. So Rich, uh, based off your laugh, um, <laughs> you have any advice to offer for that? Oh, no. You I mean, when you said balance, balance what? I was, when I saw, <laughs> I'm so completely obsessed. I spent every night in the comedy clubs back in the, you know, the late seventies, early eighties, every night, every minute thinking of jokes, writing them down everywhere. It's consumed by it. I mean, in the wee hours when you're like, really, you know, your mind would go really as my, you know, as my ambition exceeded my talents, that's the fear you would have in a dark, quiet time. But other than that, you're chasing it. I, at least for me, I, I found there's no there was no possible balance. You know, if a girlfriend said, "You know, you're doing this too much," you go next. You know, you just it didn't it it didn't it didn't equate that that there was any balance possible, or I didn't think about balance. I was just chasing that thing, and I, I'd, I'd do whatever I'd have to do to to get more stage time and to get better. And and to write more. That, that's all I care, cared about. That's it. I don't. I don't even. That's why I laughed. I just thought balance. I mean, that, <laughs> that's that's something comes when you slow down enough to actually know that you're up on a high wire. You didn't even realize you were on a high wire. You're just out there. You're just out there doing it. Nice. And so uh, for Leslie and Rich, um, you guys have been putting out your creative work for a while now. Um, I think a lot of people that want to try to be creative, whether it be uh, creating music or creating art or performing stand-up, they may seem hesitant to get started. They might not know what that first step is. Is there even a first step for people that want to try to be creative? Like, how did you guys first start out? Was it just, you just have to write? Yeah. 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 It's, it's a compulsion. It's, it's, it's something that you, you just, from an early age, I knew that this is what I wanted to do. It was one of those like career day. Like you just, I just knew I was either, you know, and, and, and then it doesn't even, it, it's just what, what you do, you practice, you learn songs, you start to write, you start to figure it out. And um, it is just something that you do. You, it's not even like a decision. It's like, this is, mm -hmm. it. so I knew it. Um, now I'm like, <laughs> great choice. But, uh, <laughs> idea <laughs> yeah, but it's yeah. it doesn't matter it's like it's still what we're doing you know i mean i'm uh it's funny now the balance is different because you don't have this the outlets that we have now so we're doing other things like i i, I started to i'm trying to learn italian that's like my big thing mm -hmm. um it's terrible it's going terribly and like just little things like that but that has nothing to do with the beginning the beginning is just all about it, it, it took over that's all I wanted. That that's actually really helpful because I mean about me. Um, even though I'm studying journalism, I aspire to be a screenwriter, uh, comedian, comic writer, etc. And I do find it hard to find the time to figure out how to write and go on. It doesn't help that I was never properly taught how to type, so I still type like this, but <laughs> rather quickly. Um, and so I want to jump yeah. into a question about uh towards rich um your work has been quite impactful to me and i'm still in the middle of your book uh kicking through the ashes which tells the story of your life during the comedy's boom in the 80s speaking of the 80s i'm pretty sure this is the jacket my dad wore in his honeymoon and i'm pretty sure clothes <laughs> were a lot more uncomfortable back then because this thing hurts but anyway um i was hoping to hear a bit more about what it was like back then and how things have changed. And my question, and Nick has a follow-up, is what aspect do you miss the most that is not around today from then? And Nick? Oh. Never mind, Rich. Go. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. Okay. Well, um, I, I'll, let me get to that, what I miss the most. Like, but, but the... The thing about um, about first about the typing, I'm a two finger typer too, and it really kind of matches the speed of my brain. I write better at that at that speed, so it's so it's okay. But uh, that makes me feel better. <laughs> but, but 
when, when I first started, I mean, it was just, you had to hang out. You just had to hang and that hasn't changed. And every generation has a different struggle to get to the, to the microphone, to get in front of an audience, to do comedy. And in my time, People didn't expect comics to come up. There were a lot of singers, songwriters. I'd go on into these pubs in Washington, D.C. where I was living and talk my way on as the only comic on the show. And then I uh, eventually met another guy running around town named Lewis Black. And we would like, oh, OK, you're doing it, too. I didn't know anybody else was doing comedy. I didn't know there were comics in New York doing it. It was kind of isolated. There's no social media. There's no Internet. There were no cell phones. And so you just sort of I was just sort of doing it and not having any instructions but there was i was also free to experiment and do whatever i wanted to do and so there was a lot of that freedom there but the struggle was to find crowds to do it now the comics have a struggle to find an audience that's not all comics they tend to perform open mics in front of other comics which is everybody knows the worst possible audience Mm. But for us, is once I got in front of a crowd, I, I opened up for a lot of rock bands. My first paying gig was opening up for the Ramones. I, I did a lot of rock bands. Opening act work was what I learned to do stand-up comedy in front of these. So I had to hold their attention. Get, like, I'd be walking out without a guitar. They go, what's he going to do? There was no, there was no like, oh, stand-up comics. Yeah, we're quite familiar with that. There, they, there were a couple of stars that they were familiar with. But by and large, there weren't young comics in front of the audiences all the time. So it was just a different challenge. I miss probably being 23 years old. That's what I miss. <laughs> I mean, I like to be 23 at any age. You know, put me back in the 1400s at 23, I'll be happy. But at 23, uh, it was just a good age for me to do it. I, uh, other than that, there's really nothing. I mean, technology was just different. Uh, that's it. The drugs were different. The <laughs> Everything was different. <laughs> it just changes. That's all. You know, you just have to work through different. Okay. You know, uh, this. <laughs> that's an I'll go stop right there. <laughs> So uh, your Ramon story is a pretty hilarious, uh, misfortunate incident. Um, so around that time in D.C., uh, when you were there, like the late 70s, that's when the hardcore scene was starting to take root there. I want to know, did you as a stand up comic and uh, musicians who were kind of starting this punk scene down there, did you both feel that there was a sense of change coming in both of your fields? Because obviously a couple of years later, uh, comedy stores started popping up across the country and then punk yeah, became a yeah. sizable movement. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the, I had a lot of musician friends and, um, you know, um, in terms of the comedy, you there, there, there's this bar just started doing comedy and all these comics showed up. These people wanted to do stand up comedy show up. So there's little scenes were popping up all over the country, bubbling underneath the surface. And then the comedy boom exploded in 80 when the comedy clubs start popping up in terms of the music. You know, you could feel it. I was a big Elvis Costello fan when he broke out in 77. The songs were shorter. The anger was tuned up. And I, I liked it. And the Ramones were the same way. These short blasting sets, the Talking Heads, all these sort of bands, which I really liked. They got away from those 15-minute songs with a four-minute drum, drum solo of the 70s. You know, those dinosaur bands were just no, no longer current and relevant. And uh, so I opened up for the Plasmatics, a lot of, rock, of punk bands back then. And uh, the energy was great. If I got a hold of that crowd, you know, and, and I matched their anger. Then they, they were like, OK, man, we'll go. You know, but you had to have that. You had to have that attitude. Fortunately, I was angry enough to, to work those clubs or work those in front of those those music crowds. Nice. So, Leslie, you mentioned that you I'm had so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> well, Wendy O. <laughs> Wendy O was a trip, man. <laughs> Late 70s are like the CBGBs, that whole scene. It's just that's yeah. amazing. I'm I'm very envious. <laughs> That's so cool. Um, Leslie, you mentioned that you have a lot of comedian friends. Um, is there still a sense of like camaraderie between musicians and comedians today, both working? Yeah, absolutely. Especially like we're all self-deprecating and trying to make fun <laughs> of everybody and just the situation around you, right? I mean, it's just just trying to make each other laugh, and especially in times like this, we need it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a fact. Um, <laughs> we have a yeah. question from one of our viewers. Um, if you can pull that up. Uh, it's from Jake. Has the time in isolation and quarantine impacted any of your writing? Um, Rich, you've mentioned that you have done material about uh, quarantine. So maybe we can start with you. Uh, do you want to maybe share one of your uh, jokes if you have a quick bit about that? Well, I, I, I did a whole bit about uh, you know, the, the, the mask, how many masks there are and how many different masks I have hanging around a house. So we have like 3000 masks around and masks everywhere in a car, 
you know, these, these, it, did, it never had a mask before. Now I have different styles, different, oh, I put on the full mask, you know, I'm going to go full incognito. Oh, this, I'm going to go for the slim mask. You know, it's a whole fashion thing now. So uh, the mask things, we're just joking about that. And, if, and the fact that, that people are stuck together in a pandemic that uh, I talked to this contractor and he's so busy working, building extra rooms in the houses because people going like, I need more room to get away from that son of a, you know what I mean? So there was just stuff that I did like that. I mean, I, 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 uh, I you know, the pandemic really, I, I guess I'm, the, on, on my, my writing is kind of writing stuff. I wrote stuff for, for the, jokes for the camp, a Democrat. And I, 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 I wrote stuff for that. And then I'm writing these stories about Trump. So I, that's it. I mean, I'm kind of venting there for the, for my political views, but, but the, the, I haven't been on stage about five times during the pandemic. So not like I'm working on a lot of new material. You know? mm -hmm. And Bruce, what about you? Any new songs uh, inspired specifically by the situation that we're in right now? Um, I, I did a few things uh, that, we're not necessarily openly talking about the quarantine or pandemic, but really I think a sense of the isolation and the weird things that come about from that. Um, and then uh, like, I think in a, we answered earlier a uh, similar sort of question, um, but a lot of collaboration did pop up during this and um, on being furloughed from a, from a job, you know, I tried to put a lot of use to the time and, finish recording, mixing and mastering music I had been working on, um, recording a lot of demos and, and kind of taking up some of my time, uh, maybe productively with the poetry or the music and, and whatnot. Um, and even doing uh, some virtual performances and, and the things that that sort of inspired. So um, I think there was some benefit to it, um, which, you know, you'd hope to get after all the, the uh, tumultuousness that it brought about as well. All right, so going off of that, a bit more of like a thinking question here. Quarantine gets lifted. Every, nobody has to wear masks again. What's your dream venue that you're playing? Where's the first place you're going? Uh, we'll start with uh, Rich. I'm going to go down to the uh, Laughing Skull in Atlanta and uh, do this show I'm doing on the history of stand-up comedy. So I'm going to do there, uh, doing it now. I'm going to be doing it in November, but I'd like to set up a little residency and really get this show down. So that's a dream place because it's a, it's a great little room. And uh, even with social distancing, it's a tight room and you can hear the laugh. So that's my dream gig, a nice tight little room to do this show that I've just started doing. Nice. And uh, Rich, without giving us a free show, could you just uh, tell us a little bit about that? I know that you mentioned that uh, pretty surprised yeah, I, you found that it, uh, stand up in America dates back to the Civil War. Right. The first uh, stand up comic was a guy named Artemis Ward, a wild character. His girlfriend was Ada Menken. She was the first sex symbol in America. They were like the first stars. And he started doing it during the Civil War. And, and he used to go to the White House and, and, and uh, entertain Lincoln late at night. Uh, he, he was a very funny guy. A lot of jokes, of course, don't, don't travel in time, but some of them do. He said one of his jokes was, we must all learn to live within our means, even if we have to borrow money to do so. And he was a very <laughs> funny guy. He was a wild partier. He was what they called a lotus eater, which means he liked um, he liked the herb. He liked the herb back then. And of course, they just go to a apo apothecary. That's what they called the drugstores back there, and you just buy it over the counter. He had he had uh, tuberculosis. He was a thin guy, never uh, could smoke, but he just ate it. And uh, but he was a great guy, a wild guy, hilarious guy. Became friends with Mark Twain. Taught Mark Twain how to do it. So I started researching, going back and found a lot of funny stories and great stories and um, things that haven't been changed. The people talk about PC now ruining comedy, but there's always been a line. There's always been protests against certain comics back in, in vaudeville in 1905 or WC Fields was, was people would protest his shows. There's always been people who went over the line and got protested. So I found a lot of really funny, great stories and, and, um, and jokes from old comics and people don't, people that they don't remember people don't remember so i just it's an american art form and i i just wanted to trace the history of it so before we get to uh leslie and bruce's um dream venue i just want to quickly yeah. i want to quickly follow up on that um have you found it um have you experienced any recent instances all of you 
um, of any cases where people got upset with your music and said that it wasn't appropriate for the times. Uh, we'll start with Bruce. Um, no, <laughs> I don't, I don't think so. Uh, there's been times where I'm in situations where I feel like, you know, maybe, yeah, I think everyone feels this where I, oh, maybe this isn't the crowd for what I do. Um, or may, maybe I'm a little left field for this. Um, but, uh, you know, you just forge ahead and you might be surprised. Like, you know, don't, don't make the audience's decision. Uh, for them, L let it happen and, and wash over them. And if they hate you, well, then you got a good practice in. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> hopefully your, your skin's a little thicker. <laughs> and if not, then uh, all your cliche artistic self-loathing was uh, approved of by a group of people. So maybe there's something in that. <laughs> nice. uh, Leslie, uh, on your latest album, you have a song about you know the opioid crisis medication and you have um, Would You Give Up Your Gun? Obviously a song about uh, gun control. Could you tell us a little bit about that? What it's like to talk about these uh, larger issues? Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard. You don't want to hit it right on the head. And uh, like with the gun song, would you give up your gun? I'm not really preaching about the way I feel about guns, which I hate them. And I think we have a major problem in this country, but I wasn't like singing that. I was just basically saying to people, you know, in order to get to make change in this country, how close does something have to hit home for someone to make a change? And, and, so, and it's also just trying to have a conversation with people who don't have the same views as you. I find it increasingly difficult in, in, in this heated climate and you can't even have a discussion with somebody because it's so polarizing. So, you know, a lot of the topics on the record is just to be able to have a conversation about things that are difficult to talk about. Mm -hmm. So I suppose, as Rich was saying, try to dance on that line. Absolutely, because you don't want to be too obvious about it. But I think it's also interesting to talk about it at the same time. <laughs> and now following up with that, what was your dream venue? <laughs> oh, well, besides my the PS, PTSD that I'm going to have. <laughs> I mean, um, you know, it's uh, like who's going to be going to like strip clubs and stuff anytime soon. <laughs> no, that was my dream. Uh, but you know, just thinking about like I had my dream gig last year. I got to open for the Who at Madison Square Garden. So it's like I, it's, I'm good. But, you know, like as soon as theaters and, and I'd love to go see a movie, <laughs> I'd love to, you know, play a beautiful sounding theater again. So, uh, you know. When it happens, it'll happen. All right. And wow, that's a great. That is great. Bruce, I believe we ha leave off with the you. Who? What's your dream place? Um, it's not really. A, the, honestly, it's going to sound corny, but the place would just be with people. Uh, I mean, ideally, I'd, I, I'd like to tour again and just be out there. I don't care if I'm doing house concerts and people's, you know, um, living rooms or if i'm playing dive bars or cafes or big theaters i just you know want to be able to like see people and and hug them and be out in the crowd again and and be among the the other musicians and whatnot and and not have to to worry and feel so you know paranoid sort of and 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 really the the crazy making that this has been um I'm more about just whatever the experiences is bring it to me i don't have any specifics in mind besides that Oh. Thanks, uh, well, hi, folks. Uh, three here. Sorry to interrupt. This is such a great conversation. I did want to get in a little bit of audio and video of each of your performances. Uh, so again, thank you to our awesome guests. And I think our students did pretty well, didn't they? Uh, yeah. <laughs> let's, let's go to each of our guests and we're going to play a little bit from their albums uh, and uh, or, or the videos that we have found online. So we're going to start with Leslie, we're gonna play from Late On Me as uh, one of the songs that we uh, saw online. So if that's okay with you, Leslie, we will, uh, we will play that in just a second. So uh, here we go. I'm just gonna share the screen here and play it. And I'm gonna turn up the audio here. Oh, 
Beautiful song. Leslie, can you set this up a little bit about, tell us about the song and even this video technique. It's really unusual. So um, Jeff Price, he, uh, he's a director um, and he happens to be uh, a cousin, not by blood, my marriage, but you know, cousin. And um, we've been wanting to do something and work together for a long time. And he, um, his first film was, he was the cinematographer for Let's Get Lost, you know, the, um, Chet Baker documentary, and he's just done beautiful yeah. work. And, and he used to direct uh, music videos back in the 80s. Like he did, um, he's done some stuff for R.E.M. and, and um, Elvis Costello, you mentioned before. And, uh, you know, anyway, so we were like, one day we'd have to do something together. And I, I said, you know, do you want to do something um, for the song? And he liked the song and, and, and uh, yeah, we did it with, in, in a room. He, did a few angles and then it was all editing. Like he's 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 also an experimental filmmaker mm -hmm. as well. So you know he really brought his artistry to it. And um, and then the song is really it's it's kind of um, it was co-written by Steve McEwen and um, it's really about kind of um, what is this what was I saying? Uh, bridge over troubled water and songs like that and the weight where you know those kind of I've always wanted to write a song like that and um, where you're just giving yourself to somebody. It's really simple. It's just it's just when you're there for somebody and, and it's just uh, in all of your guts and your soul and your heart. Well, that's beautiful. Thank you so much. Uh, Bruce, we're going to play uh, something from you now. Um, and as we as we do that, tell us, Bruce, where we can find more of your work and where people can uh, find you. Um. So you can uh, stream all of my music by searching All One. Um, you'll probably get some other people as well. <laughs> but uh, on anything, Pandora, Spotify, etc. cetera. Um, and, uh, but you can catch my whole discography at allonevoice.bandcamp.com. Um, allonevoice.bandcamp.com. Great. Yes, that's Thank right. That's all right, let's play, let's play the song, The Catch. Tell us about it. Uh, yeah, it's, it's sort of a... An autobio, uh, tracing the, the the weirdness uh, or cherry picking vignettes from my from my my childhood to now uh, at thirty two uh, of you know going from a class clown to a uh, in my teens a, a skater punk jackass wannabe filmmaker and uh, and then finding refuge and solace from my crazy ADHD head in uh, creating and performing and making music and then landing me right where I was when I was writing the song. And uh, it's the third single I've released from Emotionauts, which uh, the quarantine sort of uh, put off, but it will be out this year uh, later. Um, so yeah, that's- uh, I love all these adjectives of your, all, all the different things you, you've you done and you, you like to do. All right, let's play the cat by all one. <laughs> To the fondant, hurry, odd luck, not some of all one's journey. No bills, odd duck, quirky, squawk absurdly. Thought that he on drugs, surely. And no nil, never rip bombs, got drunk, her flurries. No pills, not a cut bar, but early. Stone built jock, junk jerseys, a lot more burping than burpees. <laughs> no frills, far flung from the posh yacht club, prom hunk, nerdy, dirty pop punk, construct 13, curly mop up, top dodge, swirly. Bookworm, never got thumb, one flirty. No deal, not fucked early. Hot stuff, jaw drops, girlies. I shut curlies, flashed in the Hall, flush, blush, go steal our props, cause he was called unworthy. Road till the cops come scurvy. Tony Hawks jumps, turnies, got us hopped up for the skate spots, yearning for the fun rush. No chill, octung, conduct, shock, buzz, search me. Hold still, chatterbox, jabberjaw, had to talk, squirmy. Joe killed, class clown, caught much, got flunk, thirsty. Goes built for the top notch cream with the crop spot, Percy. Go killed it by the small. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Uh, wow. Bruce, uh, that, that's great. Tell us a little bit about that style of music and what you're doing there. 
Uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, the, the producer that I'm working with on that album, uh, is a, is a brother, a sibling duo that go by conscious robot and they do sort of like progressive, uh, EDM sort of hip hop music. And, uh, we met while I was doing a three year weekly series of improvisational, uh, rapping YouTube called spontaneous Sundays with all one. And they started supplying me with instrumentals intermittently, uh, and became, fans of my back catalog. And then uh, about a year ago or so, we started collaborating uh, when they sent me production. Um, and uh, yeah, we started working on this LP called Emotion Aughts. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that song uh, was an attempt to uh, take a uh, three rhyme patterns uh, and, and juggle them in a sort of uh, loop uh, for about a whole verse and, and also try to, in one linear way, in a sort of impressionistic uh, uh, language, uh, talk about my, my life, my potted bio, as it were. Um, and then there's a, a refrain sort of at the end of the, the song where I'm singing multiple layers and harmonies and stuff to offer a sort of reprieve and also, um, you know, offering my uh, epiphanies as a, after the short look back on my weird and chaotic life and chaotically delivered life uh in lyric um so that's that song <laughs> <laughs> all right uh before i go to rich uh can uh can leslie again remind us where we can find your music and where we should look for you online um everywhere i'm omnipresent no it's a uh, i have a website with my name and um i'm on all the streaming sites and and um uh, youtube so you can stream stuff there. Royal Potato Family is my uh, record label, and there's stuff there too. And um, but just yeah, and then I'm I'm playing on Thursday night in an actual venue, which is crazy. But we're live streaming from City Winery, and uh, but they're also doing like small little little audience to first come first serve. You know, you can make reservations. And where is City Winery in New York? It's. Um, it's on 15th Street and, and West Side Highway. All right, so the, the, in, in Manhattan. So if you're in yeah. Manhattan and you're of yeah. legal age, please go down uh, to City Winery and watch. Right, there's college kids watching. <laughs> yeah, that's right, there are college oh, kids. kids. <laughs> Get your fake IDs. <laughs> All right, I didn't hear that. Uh, let's go to uh, Rich. We're gonna, uh, we're gonna play uh, one of your appearances uh, on The Tonight Show uh, in, back in 1984. So set up what we're, what we're about to see here, please. That's uh, uh, me deciding that it was too hot out there and I just took my jacket off, which nobody you was know, not allowed to do. And I just said, I came out there and there was some problem with the air conditioning studio. And I just looked over and I said, better catch this, I'm going to toss it. And here we go. That's All right, here we go. Well, summer's over. Here's my tan. <laughs> one day at the beach this summer, one day. I burn so easily, I get out there, I have no sunscreen. So one of my friends hands me baby oil. <laughs> well, this is liquid magnifying glass. I put this one, you might as well throw me a wok and stir fry me for a couple hours. And open the water because of sharks. And I love our attitude with sharks. As people, we can hunt and kill any creature on the planet. That's okay. But if a shark or a lion kills one of us, we flip out. Man eater. <laughs> Let's get a shark posse, boys. That one's a man eater. <laughs> As if the shark makes a choice. It's got the brain of a six pack. <laughs> I'm sure the shark is roaming the ocean thinking to itself, well, I had tuna yesterday, <laughs> tuna the day before. Well, I could go for an insurance salesman on a surfboard about that. <laughs> Definitely not one of the ways I want to die is a shark attack. I absolutely don't want to die one of those deaths where after I'm gone, everyone says, he didn't know what hit him. <laughs> you know that poor guy will never even know what hit him. That would be a terrible way to spend eternity, wouldn't it? <laughs> Walking around, people going, what happened to you? I don't know. <laughs> All right, folks, you can catch the stylings of Bruce, uh, of, of Rich Scheidner, Scheidner all, uh, all through 
uh, YouTube. There are so many clips of him on uh, on on the Tonight Show. I love those pleats uh, in your pants. Those are from the early days of the eighties. I love. I love. That, that was 80, 80, Yeah, that was my first Tonight Show shot. I thought it was a different shot, but that was eighty four. Uh, yeah, that was a whole. Yeah, I thought it was different. Now that's that's real. <laughs> looking back, eighty four. <laughs> That's a long time ago. I look at that guy and go, oh, you've got some hurt coming your way, man. <laughs> well, Rich, one of the things we should tell people is that, especially those younger folks who may not understand the power that The Tonight Show had. Oh, oh man. It was, it was, Today it we was live that, in a fragmented television environment. In those days, it, three to four channels. and people Three watched. channels, man. Yeah, That's exactly. it. So please and, tell and so us was, what that was like. It was, it was everything. I mean, every and every comic around the country was watching me. Every comic went to a TV. If I knew, you knew when comics were on, the Tonight Show was a stamp of approval. And I remember before I went on, Jerry Seinfeld called me up. He says, you've already hit the home run, man. Don't trip rounding the bases. It doesn't look good for the fans. You know, <laughs> the, the, the hard part was getting the show. And once I got out there, I mean, that material I did there, I'd honed that material for two weeks. I, you know, I... 84, I went to um, a friend of mine, Sam Kennison, another comedian. We escaped L.A. There was the Olympics route there, and the place was just jammed with tourists who couldn't speak the language and it was terrible comedy audiences. So we came to New York, which I'd lived in, uh, you know, up till 82. And I was hanging out there, and a guy from The Tonight Show, he got sick of L.A. too, and he came out to New York, and he saw me. He said, you're ready. I'll put you on two weeks. So every night I practiced that set. Once he agreed on the material, it was locked in, and I just practiced it every night. So it's a whole different experience. I mean, it made my career. Things sort of pop in ways that you can't imagine with one thing, one shot on a talk show these days. It doesn't matter. But back then, it, it it made a lot of things happen. I got big management, big agencies, started getting, you know, all sorts of different things came my way. Uh, before before we uh, give you all a chance to give us a final thought. Uh, by, by, the, by the way, by the way, I'm still I'm still trying to process my jealousy of Leslie opening up for the Who. I'm still trying to work through that. <laughs> so I just want to know and let you know how much I had to overcome just to do that little thing I just did. <laughs> uh, I I do want to make a give a plug to a a, a terrific uh, short series that ran on a Showtime called Dying Up Here, which captures the 70s and the and, and the comedy scene really well and and the role that uh, Johnny Carson played in in the success of of of, of comedy and live shows in particular it, it only I think only ran one season on Showtime but I loved the show and there were some great actors in there as there well was Jim Carrey produced it yes he right? did yeah. is it you you could just look, look at the language that I I had I couldn't I I said in, in my act, I'd go, and I didn't curse that much on stage live, but I go, that's a hell of a way to spend eternity. I had to change it. That's a terrible way to spend eternity. You had to work so clean on network TV back then. Totally different thing. You couldn't you know, say hell of a way. No, no. Well, no, well there, was, no. there was George Carlin and his seven, seven words you can't say on TV. Seven dirty so. words, right. But that, look how different that was. Lenny Bruce, 10 years before that, lost his license to perform. And was thrown in jail for, uh, uh, you know, I mean, was going to was going to be thrown into jail. But anyway, he lost his license. And Carlin in '72 comes out with that album, and he performs live in Milwaukee, the outdoor concert. And he does those seven dirty words, and they arrest him. Somebody complained, they arrest him because it was an outdoor concert. And then in his trial, in Lenny's trial, they had a police officer doing Lenny's bits, right? And Lenny was going crazy, going, "He's terrible! He's terrible! He can't perform my material! He's butchering it! You know, he's no timing, no." And in Carlin's case, they go into the courtroom and Carlin, they play the album. They play Carlin's album and the whole courtroom laughs. The judge laughs, case dismissed. It was funny. And so, but times had changed in those seven years, it had changed. It had changed. Language had changed. Wow. I know, bored everybody but me. <laughs> no, no, I think it's interesting. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, this okay. fascinating. If we can have each of our guests just give us a couple of final thoughts. And then we'll let you uh, let you go. Thank you so much for being here. We'll we'll start with Bruce. Um, well, first and foremost, be good to one another. Be good to yourselves. Take care of yourselves. I didn't get to opine, maybe because I'm I'm the the younger dude, but I didn't get to talk about the the creative question. But uh, if you want to make something or you want to do something, it's just a matter of uh, putting a little bit of effort into it every day start out uh, as though it were however it would look if it were easy and just pursue that thing doggedly um, <laughs> what other choice do you have uh, to live regretting that no 
So uh, yeah, go go uh, nurse your passions into existence and uh, take care of one another. Wow, nurse your passions into existence. Very well done, Bruce. At all one voice, please check him out. Let's go to Rich Scheidner. Well, uh, Bruce said exactly what I was going to say. So there's really not much for me to say right now. No, I'm kidding. I, I really like that what he said. I, you know, I, I'm just I'm just grateful. Thank you for having me here. I'm really impressed by the other artists that you had me on with. I, I like their music and and what they're doing, and uh, I'm just grateful to be here. Thank you. Wow. Thank you very much, Rich. Really appreciate you. And let's go to Leslie. I feel the same way. Thanks so much for having me and and uh, just being able to talk to you guys about everything that's going on. Um, I like to be kind to each other. Get out and vote. Yes. I mean, that's not obvious. One I had to say it, yes, but vote, um, vote, vote. yeah, that's that's it. Thank you, guys. Thank and you. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank I you. didn't say that, but I'm very grateful. <laughs> John Forstein says, entertaining program. Thank you. We have a hello from Philadelphia. We have lots of other comments in here. My mother is uh, saying that it's already October 28th. It's my 50th <laughs> birthday tomorrow happy, happy, birthday. Birthday. happy, happy birthday. birthday she's wishing happy me birthday. Hi, love you uh thank you very much thank you for instilling a love of art the arts a uh, lifelong love of the arts and music and comedy and everything in me so i appreciate it and i love uh the hard work of our students elisha who is off camera and shahan yes. and Nick, well done i think our students have done a great job with all of these episodes we only have a couple more left this week on Thursday and Friday. The students are going to produce two more episodes. And then tomorrow, my producers, Vandana and Rose, are uh, have asked me to just show up as a host uh, on my birthday so that they can produce the show. So we'll see what happens. Uh, I'm going to be in for a surprise, I'm sure. But we want to thank everybody for being here. Uh, congrats to the students and good luck to our entertainers. We're cheering for all of you because we want entertainment to really flourish and it helps us get through this pandemic and when we come out on the other side uh we'll need you right there with us so thank you very much and if we can ever be of help to you please let us know so let's all say goodbye everybody Bye.